Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. About five years ago, I had a video on this channel about the field found Commodore 64. It was a Commodore 64 that was literally left out in field for about 20 years, and then was just given to me. It was filled with an ant farm and pine needles and dirt and mud. I hosed the computer off and miraculously, it just worked. Well, I think it needed like a little bit of deoxid and a socket or two, and I think I had to change a fuse, but otherwise it just worked. In case you're wondering what happened to that machine, here it is, this is it, and guess what? It still works perfectly. I had it up on the wall in my little showcase room, and I hadn't turned this on in years. I just plugged it in, and there it is, running the 8-bit dance party. Sound is even working perfectly as well. The subject of today's video is we have another field found computer. It's not a Commodore 64 this time, it's this machine right here, the Commodore Amiga 500. And in this box, there are a few different accessories as well. And there was even a 1084 monitor that came with this thing. And let's just say this is in really rough shape. And I actually don't really know if I'm going to be able to get this thing working. So without further ado, let's get right to it. What you're watching here is footage of me looking at this computer for the very first time. This is exactly how I got the machine and it was dirty and I didn't want to bring it in the house directly. So you can see here on the underside of the machine, the RAM expansion card is in terrible shape. And this is just a harbinger of what we're about to see on the inside of the machine. Look at the keyboard there and the rust and the corrosion. It looks bad. The top of the computer doesn't look too bad though, but I think it's going to be bad on the inside. The cables here are all just permanently attached to the machine and rusty as all heck. In fact, I can't even get the RCA connectors off at all. They are completely stuck on there. The same goes for the connectors with screws. They're completely fused in there. Look at the joystick here. It is unbelievably gross. It's supposed to be a cream color, not this horrible, nasty, moldy color. I actually ended up just throwing this away. I didn't even want to bring this into the house. In the bottom of the box was the Amiga 500 trapdoor, which is kind of nice. These parts aren't super common. This one sure is rusty though. The power supply is really in bad shape as well. On the outside, it doesn't look so bad, but the power switch is completely stuck. And I have a feeling inside is just carnage. I'm trying to get the RCA jacks off and they really don't come off. It actually just broke the entire cable. So we're gonna have to resort to some WD-40 to try to get all these cables off because not only RCAs are stuck, but even these other D sub connectors are completely stuck as well. So a liberal application of WD-40 should hopefully help. Let's take a close up look at the mouse and this poor thing is completely wrecked. The top cover is missing. I tried to open the bottom hatch to get the ball out, but that was just completely stuck. I don't think there's any saving this mouse. Now the WD-40's had some time to soak in. I'm using some pliers to remove the connectors and the RCA jacks came off. I'm trying to get these other ones off. Oh, it's not really working so well, but vice grips are definitely helping. That was the video cable that we just removed and uh, mm, worse for wear. By the look of this connector, I'm not sure this floppy drive's ever gonna work again. It's now time to take a look inside this Amiga 500. The screws of course are completely rusted and many of them were really hard to access, but I did manage to get a good enough grip on them with a the screwdriver to get these Torx bits out of the case. Popping the lid, we get our first glimpse of the inside of the machine. Wow, <laughs> that's a lot of rust. There isn't as much plant debris as there was in the old Field Found 64, but this thing is a disaster on the inside. I don't have any background information on where this machine came from, so I don't know how it got this bad, but we can assume that it was exposed to a lot of water over a long period of time. Well, I was able to get the RF Shield screws out I wasn't able to fold up the little tabs as those had completely rusted. So I essentially had to use forks to just rip the shield off. I did manage to slice my hand on the RF shield, but luckily I've had all my tetanus shots, so I should be okay there. 
Things don't look super great on the motherboard, but I suppose they also could be worse. There's not a lot of plant debris, as I mentioned, but ooh, is this thing in bad shape. Let's get this floppy drive out of the machine. It just sort of fell out and <laughs> I don't really think there's ever a chance this drive is gonna work again. Mechanical things that have moving parts inside really don't like moisture. And just looking at this drive, you can tell that it's been exposed to a lot of moisture. And take a listen to the spindle when I try to turn it. It's crunchy, which uh, I don't think it should be. The motherboard comes out with the attached RF shield and you can see the rust residue left behind from the rusting RF shield on the bottom. It's a lot less rusty than the FieldFound 64 was though. And there we have it. That's the Amiga 500 motherboard in this poor FieldFound computer. On the bottom there, you can see there's actually some shiny metal, so it's not all bad, but look at the close up. That's rough. And the problem on the Amiga versus the Commodore is that most of the chips are in sockets, while the FieldFound 64 had very few things in sockets, which actually is a lot better from a corrosion standpoint. And this is the 1084 monitor that I got with the computer, and I'm not so sure about this thing either. All of the controls are completely frozen. Even the power button doesn't move. None of the knobs turn. There's lots of rust on the inside. It's, it's not looking good. At the minimum though, the tube is probably something we can still reuse. Now it's time for a wash on the motherboard. Just like on the FieldFound 64, I put it on my deck and I hit it with the hose. The main idea really is it's just gonna be easier to handle this board. It won't make everything filthy like my hands and my workbench as I start to work on it. Now the thing is all wet. It looks all shiny and nice. Well, nice in air quotes, but we'll see when this thing is on the bench, if this can be revived. The Amiga 500 motherboard is on the bench. Now, since I took this machine apart, it's been a few months actually. So all the water that I sprayed on this thing has totally dried. And after I did that, well, once the water had dried, I sprayed a liberal coating of deoxid on all of the chips. I didn't remove anything from the sockets though. So this is exactly how it was at the end of that video, other than the deoxid. As I had mentioned in the disassembly, I'm really concerned about the fact that all of the main chips here are in sockets. And anytime you have sockets and you have corrosion, that is a recipe for a machine that's not working. All the stuff that's actually soldered directly onto the board is probably fine. But I wanna see if we can get this machine working without swapping out all the sockets. The only socket that I think I may need to change is this one here for the Fat Agnes. We know these are problematic on Amigas as you saw in that last Amiga video I did, the Art Project Amiga. So we may need to swap this one out because just take a look at all the corrosion that's on there. That, that really isn't looking very good. Let's go through all the socketed chips and just see how things are looking. So there's the Denise chip there, definitely corrosion on the pins, but nothing looks super bad. This is the video hybrid here that uh, takes the output of this and then converts it to the RGB and goes to this connector here. Next, we have the two CIA chips and that one there, it's looking not too bad. I mean, it's definitely corroded as is that one, but eh, there's a chance with some deoxid, things might work. The floppy drive connector looks okay, as is the power connector there. Over here on this section of the board, we have a good amount of corrosion. The same goes for this area as well. Just look at all that crust there. Moving back to the left, we have the Gary IC here, which is looking a little crusty, although as long as we're not seeing lots of rust and stuff, it should be okay. This is just sort of like an oxide that's on there. Paula chip as well is, uh, no, you know, not looking terrible, could be worse. We have a rusty crystal oscillator though, which could potentially be an issue. Over here on the expansion interface, we definitely have a good amount of rust that's here and here that came from that shield that was on there. Look at some of the pins there. Aren't looking so great, but fiberglass pen takes that right off. The Motorola 68000 actually looks in pretty good shape. Its pins probably look the least corroded of all the other chips in this system. And then we have the onboard 512K of RAM and looks okay. All of these soldered logic ICs seem okay on this system. I think there shouldn't be too much trouble. And then the RAM expansion here, while there's a lot of rust on it, I don't see the green and crusties on there, which implies that potentially the battery in this somehow didn't leak terribly. Now, other problem areas might be these ports here. This one looks okay, but I think the joystick was left plugged into this one and it corroded badly. The audio output jacks, <laughs> those look absolutely horrific, as does the disk drive port here. <laughs> it's not good. 
We have the serial and parallel ports, which you don't really care about. The power jack's probably fine. And then the video connector, mm, not good at all. So at the minimum, I anticipate I'm gonna have to swap out the RGB connector. So I went ahead to one of my scrap Amiga 2000 motherboards and I pulled off the disk drive port, the video port, a couple of the RCA jacks, and I got this off of an old PC ISA card. I really highly recommend keeping scrap parts around. You never know when you're gonna need to find a hard to find part. And the RGB and the disk drive ports on the Amiga are DB23s, and these haven't been made in a long time. I know there's reproduction parts that are being made for the cable side, but I have no idea if the PCB mount connectors like this are still being manufactured. So taking these off an old scrap motherboard along with some period correct RCA jacks jacks, it's probably a good thing to do. Okay, so I think the first thing I want to do is try to get this RF shield off the board. We haven't looked on the underside of this yet, so I don't really know how bad things are going to look. So let me just get all these nuts off the connectors, and we'll take a look under the board. Okay, the motherboard is free. Let's see how it looks. Oh, the bottom is not too bad. There's uh, that right there, but other than that, this plastic sheet that was on here kind of protected the motherboard itself Whoa, <laughs> from getting the corrosion on it directly. <laughs> that probably came from a hole in the sheet, like right there, that allowed the corrosion to get through. And since this is iron oxide, it's probably conductive. So I need to try to get that off. Also what's happened here is there's tons of rust and debris on the bench here. So I'm gonna need to actually, you know what we should do? Let's get this out of here and then I'll clean up the bench to get all that iron oxide off. So this thing is like raining debris out of it. <laughs> there's no chance of any kind of desoldering action on this. So I'm just gonna have to get a pry bar here and we'll just pry it apart. Ooh, it's so crunchy sounding. Oh, there's so much debris in here. Look at this. Oh dear, oh dear. You know, it doesn't look too bad though. And the corrosion, it's like there's a little bit of corrosion there, but it's minimal. The board is free. <laughs> and this is as expected, a rusty, rusty mess. There's that nickel cadmium battery there. And yeah, just a tiny bit of corrosion, but I've seen far worse. I scrubbed the RAM expansion board with some IPA. Didn't really make a huge visible difference, but some more chunks of rust came off. And I dripped some vinegar on this area here to kind of eat away at the battery leakage there. I'll just clean that off in a moment, but I'll let that soak in. And for the motherboard, I'm gonna use some WD-40 on here instead. See if this does a better job. Use this old toothbrush here. Nice, this seems to have cut it back. Now looking at this area, ooh, that's pretty ugly as well. Let's hit this with some WD-40 as well. Who knows if this is the right stuff for the job, but it doesn't really matter. Anything that helps will help. Now look at this area here. You can definitely see there's a good amount of corrosion under the solder mask. And this is exactly like the Field Found 64. It had this going on all over the board. But if you can believe it, I didn't really do anything to that area. I just left it. And it hasn't seemed to have gotten any worse on the Field Found 64. So as long as these traces aren't broken, I think we should be okay. This is the RGB connector and that's the composite connector. And uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a bit crusty under here as well. Although everything looks okay. Like I don't see any traces that are obviously broken here. All right, I think the first thing I need to do is I'm gonna swap these two connectors out here just so we have the best chance of having at least a video signal to see if this machine is working at all. By the way, just look at the audio output jacks, but look at the joystick port. There's a hole in the shield, an actual rust hole. That is hilarious. Alrighty, there we have it. New RCA jack for the composite video and a new RGB connector has been added. This RCA jack was really difficult to get out. The corrosion was making it very difficult to solder. The new one went in pretty easily and this actually came out quite easily and the new one went in fine as well. Incidentally, the quote unquote new one does have a little bit of rust on the top part there, but the pin area is completely fine. All right, enough dilly dallying on my part. Why don't we try to power this thing up Maybe it works. I mean, there's a chance, right? So I have my modern Amiga power supply here. Let's plug this in. I did spray a little bit of contact cleaner into the power connector, just by the way. Definitely felt a little crunchy going in though. Hmm. And we'll do what I always do. I'm gonna start with composite video for the testing. And the blue box you see there is the retro tank, which I've already power cycled and set back to composite video because I always constantly have issues with it. So let's turn this on. And let's see what happens. I predict it's definitely not gonna work. 
Uh, there isn't even a video output at all. I went ahead and I switched to RGB. Let's just see if there's anything here at all. No, absolutely nothing. Now, all sorts of things can cause no video. For instance, the Denise could be bad. The hybrid could be bad. But more importantly, the crystal oscillator needs to be working and the Agnes needs to be working because the Agnes generates the clocks that are used all over the system, including for the video circuitry. So I think the next step is let's just go right for the socket on the Agnes and we'll swap this out. I suppose before we do that, though, I should try to remove the chip from the socket. Let's hope that this doesn't kill the chip. It might. Oh, no, that came out OK. And you know what? Those pins look OK here. Not too bad. But this socket, on the other hand, that doesn't look super great. But you know what? Before I swap it out, let me just try to use the fiberglass brush on these pins a little bit and then I'll try to clean it with some contact cleaner and let's see if that works. It's definitely getting a little dirty and crusty looking. I cut off a fresh section. So hopefully this might actually work. I don't know. And while we have the brush out, let me just do these pins on here as well. This is CRC contact cleaner, by the way. I'm not using Deoxit, not quite yet, but we will. And just like last time, I'm gonna push these pins out so they make a little bit better contact with the socket. Alrighty, there is one Fat Agnes chip from 1988, ready to go back into the motherboard. I am gonna use some Deoxid D5 on this connector first though, just to kind of give it the best chance of working. That other contact cleaner is really good at clean up corrosion, but I really do like the oil coating that Deoxid has. I tend to feel it gives longer term protection than the regular contact cleaner. Okay, there we go, it's in. Keep in mind the only chip I've removed from this motherboard is the Fat Agnes, what we did just now. I haven't touched any of the other chips. These are still in the sockets, just as they were when I found this machine. So let's turn this on and see if we have any difference. Oh, there's a blue screen now. What? Whoa, we are actually getting life out of this machine. I mean, it's a, it's a yellow screen, but it's something. Wow, oh, and it's flashing. Okay, so I could pretty much be assured that this crystal oscillator is good. Ooh, although look at this, how when I'm touching the board, it's changing in brightness and we're getting green flashing now. So definitely taking this thing out and trying to clean up the socket helped a little bit, a little bit. Although these kinds of errors, like the flashing green, I think, I need to look up what kind of kickstart this is, if this is 1.3 or 2.0 but it starts out purple, I don't know. Okay, <laughs> we have signs of life, everyone. We have freaking signs of life with just cleaning the socket and putting the chip back in. Amazing. If we think about this for a second, the fact we're getting a green screen here, although it's not really flashing now, the fact that we're getting a green screen kind of implies that the CPU is running, the clock is good, the ROM is running, like it's executing code. If we take this ROM chip out, it won't do anything. We won't have any kind of activity on the machine. Starts out purple and then goes green. <laughs> I don't know, that doesn't quite seem right. But uh, <laughs> anyways, we don't even know what's going on, especially when these chips have bad connections in here. Let's just push everything back down into, the, into their sockets here. Oh, CPU is kind of loose in there. All right, let's power cycle it again. <laughs> I feel like we're we're not that far away from working. Now we're getting a yellow. <laughs> okay. I just looked up the Kickstart part number 315093-02 and we're running Kickstart 1.3. So I need to go look up the color codes, the flashing color codes for 1.3 to see if we're, what we're getting here is even logical or makes any kind of sense at all. A quick search for Kickstart 1.3 errors revealed these here. So green, error in the chip RAM and yellow, CPU encountered an error. If we power cycle the machine one more time here, that looks normal, the gray there, but see, it doesn't come out of that gray. It should like go gray to white when you're on this kickstart version. And look, now we're just sort of stuck. All right, well, I'm really excited we have signs of life, but I'm really hungry, it's lunchtime now. So I'm gonna go grab some lunch and then we'll come back and we'll keep troubleshooting. All right, I'm back, lunch has been consumed and I've been thinking about what to do next on this computer. So now that we have signs of life, that's a great thing. We're still getting inconsistent results and I don't feel confident that we don't have some bad connections. So I think really the next step here is to take the CPU and the Kickstart ROM out, clean these pins with the 
fiberglass brush and then put deoxid in those sockets. That's at the minimum. I want to at least get to a point where we're getting consistent error messages. Ooh, it's really crunchy coming out of the socket here. <laughs> When you're not getting consistent results, it just kind of screams that you have like maybe intermittent or bad contacts, you know, with the ROM or with the CPU. And I mean, it could be with the Agnes still, to be honest. I think that's okay, you know, now that we've done the deoxid, but you never really know. So since these chips have been here a long time, I'm just gonna kind of rock them out. I don't wanna yank them too hard. It could like rip pins right out or damage the sockets. I wanna try to preserve as much on this computer as I can. There it is, CPU came out. I'm not seeing any signs of problem whatsoever on this Motorola CPU, eight megahertz, 1988. And then looking at the Kickstart ROM, hopefully that focuses. <laughs> That's not great right there. That's the kind of thing we're looking for. And on this side, same thing. And we have to remember that it's Kickstart ROM that's actually running the diagnostics on this thing, those boot time diagnostics. Well, the CPU is running it, but the code for the diagnostics is actually coming out of the Kickstart ROM. And this pin right here with this corrosion, it's very weak. I could just feel it bending super easily, much easier than it should. I think I'm just gonna break this pin off entirely. It just came off very easily. And I'll go grab a spare IC and then solder on some new pins. That was the worst one. Let's see about this one here. Yeah, that one's fine. The fiberglass pen is not doing a perfect job at getting those pins clean. I'd like to see them a little bit cleaner than they are there. They're also looking not so great on that side. So I'm gonna grab the Dremel and I'm gonna try to polish these. All right, we have the Dremel and the little rubber tip. Let's see if this does a better job here. I gotta be careful. Yeah, I think this does a better job. Okay, the pins are decently polished up. I mean, it's not perfect, but I think that should give decent contact in the socket. And now I just need to reattach a new pin there. So first of all, we'll just tin the one that's on here now. I have a pin I broke off of this dead 6502 here. We'll just uh, tin that as well. Sticks to the tip. All right, it's not pretty, but it should do the trick. I'll just say there's a little IPA to get all the dust off it and whatever else that's on it. We'll just wipe off the pins there. You can see all that coming off. Now take a look at the two sockets on here. In typical fashion, this is the 80s and it's Commodore. Single wipe, not good quality. That is just how it goes. Some deoxid in the socket. Let's get the ROM back in there. And the notch on the ROM is towards the back of the computer and the CPU is towards the front. It's a little unusual the way that works. Oh, that goes in really hard, not very easily. And one last check of the CPU. I don't see any corrosion on the inside of those legs. And that side looks okay as well. So hopefully deoxid is all this thing needed, if this was even a problem at all. All right, ready for more testing. Let's turn this on. Okay, it goes to the green screen, which is chip RAM. But the question is, are we gonna have inconsistent results where we see yellow or other things. It's weird how it starts out purple as well. If it's green every time, then maybe that just means there's either a chip RAM problem or the Agnes chip is not happy. So far we're having consistent chip RAM problems. And this might be a good chance for us to switch to the diagnostic ROM because that can generally do some activity on the machine, like it can display text, even if the chip RAM is not working because it runs the code directly out of the ROM space. One more try turning this off and on. Oh, uh, and that time it didn't do anything. Purple, like what does purple do? Pur purple doesn't mean anything. Should never be purple. All right, and it's back to green after two purple attempts. All right, I think it's time to switch to the diagnostic ROM. I think I already have one made. Let me find it. All right, I found a little selection of ROMs here, including an original 2.04 or 2.05 Kickstart ROM. Here is the Logica Diagnostic ROM, that's one of them. And then this is the other one that's been floating around that's more modern. I just wanna interrupt while I'm editing the video. I didn't realize at the time of making this video that the Rev5 motherboard requires a modification done to the board so you can use any of these ROM chips that I have here. They're all EEPROMs except for the 2.04 ROM and none of these will work in the machine without a modification done to the board. I should have remembered this because I've done this exact modification to another Amiga 500 in the past, but I clearly forgot. And yeah, there's gonna be a bunch of testing here with these ROM chips and none of it could possibly work on this board, even if this board were working perfectly because the modification has not been done. Okay, the system is off. Let's get this ROM out and switch to 
I don't know which one I'm gonna switch to. We could try putting in a newer Kickstart ROM. Let's just try this factory fresh Kickstart ROM, just, just for fun. Let's see what this one does, if anything different. Now it goes right to purple screen. It actually has me curious. What if we turn the machine on with no ROM installed? Do we get anything? Oh, we're getting a purple screen. Should that even be happening? I'm not sure you should have any activity at all when you have no ROM installed in the system. Diagnostic ROM. Purple. <laughs> that implies we're not running any code right now. None at all. Just for grins, I'm taking the Agnes out again. And with this chip removed and we turn on the computer, we're not gonna have anything yet. So we get absolutely nothing at all. Let's pop this back in though. Let's just reseat it basically. See if that changes anything. No, full on purple. So we're not even getting the green screen. We're not getting any screens now, just purple, even with the ROM chip removed. And that's just screams suspicious to me. So next up, I'm taking out Denise here and I'm gonna put some deoxid in the socket here. Well, well, first we'll clean up the pins if necessary, then we'll deoxid the socket. And as you can see, Denise is looking okay. I don't see any issues whatsoever. So let's deoxid here. Oh, that, that pin looks bad. And that pin right there too looks bad. They're just sort of dull. So let's put this back in the socket. There we go. Let's see if there's any difference. I'm not really thinking there will be any difference. No, just purple again. How about if we remove the CPU? We're getting a purple screen again? Yes, we are getting a purple screen. Maybe the purple screen is what happens when the CPU is not initializing things. Let's pop in a known good CPU into this system. We'll see if that changes anything. Nope, instant purple. Putting back in the 1.3 ROM, which at least gave us some signs of life. And uh, yeah, we're getting nothing now. I feel like I'm actually riding up against bad sockets. And I'm wondering if the ROM socket has gone bad. It is a really bad quality single wipe socket. I'm just gonna push down on it really hard here. Yeah, there's no activity. I think at this point, it's really time to break out the oscilloscope. But actually before we do that though, I wanna grab the other motherboard from the art project system, which is this one right here. And I wanna see how this thing looks with the CPU removed. Cause as you can see, there's no CPU in here right now. I wanna see if we see that same purple screen. Is that like the default behavior of the Amiga when there's no CPU in here? Let's see what we get. No, we're getting a total black screen on this thing. Interesting. So let's pop in the CPU that is actually from the other motherboard. This is the one from the field found Amiga. Because while we have it, we might as well make sure that it works. Okay, that looks normal. I'm gonna get my marker and give it a tick mark here. So we know the CPU is good on the other system. But now the question is, is why are we getting that purple screen on the other one? What, what's creating a purple screen when there's no CPU installed in it? Is the Denise chip bad? Let's, let's just swap it over, test the Denise chip from the other one in this motherboard. So I'm gonna put back in the original CPU from the Art Project one. That's this one here that was in the other machine. And this Denise chip is the one from the Field Found machine. This is the one from the Art Project one. I'd like to see if this Denise is working okay and if it causes this purple problem. Oh, it was purple. Did you see that? So one thing is it's obviously working fine, but the funny thing is, is the initialization is purple. Well, it was that one time. Let's take out this ROM chip and let's see if it initializes to purple now. Yes, yes. What strange behavior. I've never seen that before. I haven't worked on that many Amigas and there might be people screaming at their screen now who have seen that. But interesting is it initializes to purple. So that kind of tells us that the other machine is not even initializing at all. It's not getting past just, well, it's powering on, but it's not actually running any code. With the art project kickstart back in there, let's just make sure it boots up there purple for a second and then it goes into a normal boot process. Now, one thing I wanna demonstrate is the Gary chip, which I mentioned is kind of like the PLA of the Amiga. If we take this out of the art project machine here, I think what we're gonna end up with is a purple screen with this particular Denise here. Okay, so with Gary removed, we power this on, purple screen. Yeah, it, it needs to be working, the Gary chip, for this system to work at all. So I think we need to also put some deoxid in the Gary socket on the other one. Let's put that back in, make sure this is still working. Okay, 
We're back on the machine. I haven't deoxidated anything. I just put the chips back in there to see if we're still in the same situation. Purple screen, it doesn't even go to green. So we're like worse off than we were before. At least the green and those yellow colors we saw were seemingly the kickstart trying to run something. But now we're dead in the water again. So let me carefully get Gary out of here. And the chip is bending because the socket is so corroded. Don't break, please, don't break. All right, there's Gary. It's certainly very crusty though. And the socket, that looks terrible. Absolutely horrible. These pins are super bad. I think this goes back to what I was saying early on in this video. I may end up just needing to swap all these sockets, which really is unfortunate because that's just a ton of work. But there we go. Gary's back in. Let's see if that made any difference at all. No, it did not. So I think at this point, all we have left to do is really go to the oscilloscope and start probing around here and just seeing if this thing is even trying to execute code. If we go to the ROM socket, for instance, we should be able to see the chip select enabling to try to read off the ROM. And if that's not happening, well, we know there's like more fundamental problems on this machine. Okay, so we have the Motorola 68000. So I think the first thing we need to start with is the clock and the reset signal. So the reset signal is pin 18. All right, so I'm on pin 18 when we power this on. Okay, it goes out of reset, good sign. So it starts low, goes high, that's exactly what it should do. The next pin is the halt pin, so it's pin 17. Now we turn this on, yeah, it never goes out of halt. Halt is active low, signal, as you can see by the picture there, pin 17, it can go in or out. So it can be generated by the CPU or it can be instructed by something on the computer to halt as well. We do have the clock signal on pin 15. Zoomed in, we should see around like 7 point something megahertz. This thing does a terrible job at the frequency counting, but that is, seems correct for the Amiga. So we're getting a good clock. That's coming from the Fat Agnes chip. I think for pin 17, the halt pin, all I can really do is take the pin out of the socket. Like we'll pull the CPU out, bend that pin out, and then we can see if the CPU starts to execute code because I've actually had this issue before. And I think we'll have to look at the schematic, but I think Gary is what's responsible for that halt signal. All right, the pin is lifted out. And if we probe this pin and we turn on the computer, it, is the computer on? Yes, it is. That pin's not doing anything at all. Let's pull that high with a resistor to five volts. I have a 10K resistor hooked up between the VCC and the halt pin. Let's now probe the halt pin when we power on the computer. See if it looks different. Okay, did you see that? It kind of went up to five volt for a second and then it did go into halt. Turning on the computer with the video capture doesn't really do anything, okay. So CPU is absolutely asserting the halt signal itself, but on the other hand, it's also getting the halt signal from probably Gary. All right, so halt pin, there it is, 17 on the CPU. It goes to the expansion interface and then it goes down here and it is actually pulled up to five volts through 4.7K. And there it is, halt pin 42 on which chip? Gary, there it is. Well, one thing I can say for sure, I just took the Gary chip out again. I mean, the pins are really crusty, but worse is this socket is in such horrible condition I'm really skeptical that this socket is, is actually okay. I think I should grab the Gary off the other computer, the art project one, stick that in here and let's, let's see what happens. I probably should have taken the custom chips out of this board, the field found one and put it in the art project one, just to see if that made any difference at all. I'm just gonna restore pin 17 back to being in the socket again. Okay, there it is. I am on pin 17. If we turn this on, Wow, it stays in halt. So the Gary is generating the halt signal because it's probably, I guess, unhappy about, about something else. And this is the Gary we know works, but what we don't know is if this socket works. So pulling Gary out should result in the halt signal being pulled up to five volts. So there's halt at five volts. Let me just power cycle this a few times here. Yeah, it goes right up to five volts, okay. And if we put back in the known good Gary, that just stays right at ground. It doesn't even attempt to go up. I put the original field found Gary back in. Yeah, same thing. So as I said, the CPU is not gonna run any code whatsoever when Gary is unhappy and is holding the halt signal at ground. It has to be up at five volts for the CPU to start running. 
the CPU can assert a halt signal on its own if later it, say, is unhappy about, like it crashes or whatever, then it can put a halt signal out as well. But when halt is going into it, as far as I remember, the 68000 is not going to run any code at all, so it'll never have a chance of even going to the ROM or really doing anything. I just wanted to probe on Gary itself to look at its outputs. I wanna make sure that it has a good reset signal on pin 41, and I wanna make sure that it has, well, we can look at the halt signal coming out of 42. All right, I am on pin 42 here with Gary. Yep, we're not getting anything out of that pin at all, just a little glitch, which is exactly how the other one was acting. Let's look at the reset pin input. Okay, yep, it goes out of reset just normally. My assumption is it probably asserts the halt signal until the reset, well, the reset ends, but we're definitely stuck in halt. I did a quick search and indeed, typically the halt line will come up just after reset. And if the CPU detects a fault, it will assert it as in the halt signal a couple clocks later. We're not seeing that though, right? We had the pin floating on the CPU and it was asserting it, but it wasn't doing it right away. But the Gary chip is never coming out of halt. Now, what sucks is if we had some like good technical documentation for the Amiga, like about how the custom chipset works, we could figure out what are the conditions required for Gary to stop asserting the halt line. But unfortunately, I've never read any kind of deep technical documentation about, well, like what the Gary chip does exactly. And when we look at the pinout for Gary, we can see that there's like other signals on here. Obviously there's like address lines. I don't think those matter, but there are these other signals and maybe one of these causes Gary to assert the halt line. And if one of those connections is bad in this socket, for instance, maybe that's the problem. But I guess I just don't know. I suppose one of the other issues is here's Agnes and we can see that it has several connections that go directly to Gary. And maybe one of these is bad. And maybe the problem is Agnes itself. I mean, I don't think it's the chip, but maybe the socket is bad. And one of these signals needs to be low. I mean, see these ones with underscores? Those are all low assertions. Maybe those need to be low when the system operates normally or Maybe they need to be high when the system operates normally. So I'm gonna look at Gary on this machine and maybe swap to the other machine just to look at the signals coming from Agnes. So on pin 26, CDAC, that is probably a clock signal. Yep, seven megahertz, so that's clock. And then the next one is CCKQ27, 3.5 megahertz. That's like half the clock, that looks good. And then the next one here is 28 and that looks okay as well. Now I'm on pin 20, which is RAM enable coming from the Agnes chip. And that goes, well, floats it looks like, and then it goes high. And then we have pin 19, BLISS, bliss. It is high right now, and that's asserted when it's low. So, okay. Now I'm on pin 18, regen, also asserted when low, and that's just high. So, so far, 18, 19, and 20 have all been high. And now I'm on pin 15, the blit pin, and that's also just high. Let's just double check. I'm turning the computer off and on. Yeah, it starts low and then goes high. So to reiterate, 15, 18, 19, and 20 are all high, and then 26, 27, and 28 all have clock signals on them. Let's take a look at how the signals look on the other machine. I wanna have to put its Gary chip back in. <laughs> and what we should do is just validate that this machine for sure is actually working now after pulling a bunch of chips in and out. All right, turn this on. Looks good. Say we have a working system here still, which is good after pulling those chips in and out so much. All right, I'm on pin 20, which is RAM enable, power cycle of the computer. Okay, well, it starts out low and then goes high and then there's activity, but the system is, well, the system is crashed. Uh, that's not good. <laughs> what did I do? Did I somehow wreck this computer? Okay, let's try that again. <laughs> All right, well, this machine is working okay again. Let's go back to Gary and look at the RAM enable pin. Okay, so there we are back on RAM enable. So what I was trying to say is when I powered on the machine, it had the same behavior where it went low, then high, and it just stayed there for a while until it started executing code. So yeah, what's good is this looks the same where it starts low, then it goes high and stays high for a second, and then it starts doing stuff. Well, that's when the computer is executing code, so we'd expect it to be doing stuff, but at least it is in the high state, just like it is on the uh, other system. All right, now we're on pin 19. Let's just power cycle the computer again, and let's watch it. Okay, it goes high, and then once the computer starts executing code, and it starts doing stuff. Now we're on pin 18, turn this on, same thing, it just goes to high, and then once the system is executing code, it's actually doing stuff. All right, and now we're on pin 15, the blit chip. This one was just high on the other one as well. Turn it on. Ah, there's activity instantaneously. That is interesting. Hmm. 
So that signal is different because instantly we're getting those pulses. It goes high with those pulses. What if that's required for Gary to like assert or take away the halt signal, for instance? While we're here, let's take a look at the clock signal. So this one here is uh, seven megahertz, which is correct. That's pin 26. Pin 27 is 3.5, which is the same as the other one. And pin 28 is also 3.5, same as the other one. Okay, so the clock signals look the same. All right, and I'm on the halt signal now. So if we power cycle the computer, yeah, okay. So it stays in the halted state, pops up, and then the computer starts executing. So we can assume that as soon as the computer comes out of reset, so there's a separate circuit on here that controls that, then Gary changes the halt from asserted, which is down at ground, and puts up to five volt. And then that starts the execution of code in the CPU. Now, if we check out Gary here, there are some more signals up here, but I have a feeling that these ones here probably come from the CPU itself. Some of them are going into the fat Agnes, but if we go over here, yeah, they come to this, they go to the CPU. So I'm still a little confused. We have some more inputs. So this is a bi-directional signal. That's an input, that's an input, and that's an input. That's all going into the Gary chip. These signals on the top of Gary are outputs because they are controlling the activity of these transceivers and these latches here. And I'm not 100% sure what this VPA signal does, pin two on Gary. That is going up to the CPU. Pin 21 is an input, so we don't need to worry about that. That is not something that's telling Gary to halt the system. So I'm not really seeing too much else. I think these signals here, including this X ready, maybe that's one we really need to take a look at. So pin 31 on Gary. All right, we are on pin 31 here. That signal is just high. It stays low and then it goes high. Now I'm on pin 30, which is the OVL signal, whatever that does. That is just low right now, but it says it's active high, so that's okay. And this is pin 29. OVR, but with an underscore, so it's active low. So if we power cycle the machine, what do we get here? A little spike, and then it goes high. So this is on pin 29. Okay, so pin 29 is high, pin 30 is low, and then pin 31, let's just double check how that looks. That is just high. Okay, I'm gonna swap back to the other motherboard, and let's see if those three signals look as they do. And if they don't, then we can go try to chase, trace them back to where they come from. All right, we're on pin 29, and on the other machine, this was high once the system was running. And yep, that is high. And then now I'm on pin 30, which on the other system was low because this is an active high signal. And this just stays high. That's not right. Okay, that, that doesn't match. And let's look at pin 31. This is the X ready signal. That's the same, that is high, which is how it was on the other one. Okay, so pin 30 is the one that doesn't match. It should be low on this motherboard. And now let's figure out where that's coming from. The little six right there indicates that it's coming from page six. So here we are, page six. I'm just searching the schematics here and it says overlay ROM over RAM, but there it is. It's actually coming out of the 8520, the one that's in U7. Let's pull this out. Maybe this chip is bad and who knows, maybe that can cause the system to not run. Pretty gross looking, the pins on there. Hmm. Let's power this up. Oh, well, <laughs> I had some kind of hope for a sec. Let's see if the CPU is out of halt, at least. All right, I'm on pin two. Uh, yes, look at that. It's coming out of halt now. All right, so now we're at least getting, we're at least getting the freaking green screen. That's better than nothing, everyone. Better than nothing. Is it consistent? Let's put the diagnostic ROM in if it is. Oh, that's not great. Okay, well anyways, I'm still putting the diagnostic ROM in once I figure out which one chip it is, it's this one right here. So this is the diagnostic ROM, the EEPROM that I have. Pop that in, turn this on. Okay, so just, we're still, wait, oh, at least it went to a black screen. That's more than it's been doing. <laughs> that's more than it's been doing. Let's see, is the CPU in halt here? Okay, so that is the halt pin, and it means it's not in halt. So it goes out of halt. Oh, we're getting a red screen, that's interesting, and then it goes away. Hmm. And look at this chip that I took out. It is crust-o-matic, wow. Now the system is acting very inconsistent right now. It doesn't seem to be working at all at the moment. I wonder if I have to have a working one of these chips in there though. Hmm. Now, one thing I know about this particular diagnostic ROM is it does try to output stuff from the serial port. So I'm gonna plug in a cable into this thing, even though it's all rusty back there. And we'll see if we're seeing any kind of life out of the serial port on this when we power it up. 
All right, so what we're looking at here is nice Kundra bot on COM1. Are we getting anything? We're getting nothing, nothing at all. Oh, you know what though? I pulled the uh, CIA out of the socket. So maybe that's quite possible that that's gonna break the serial port. Well, let's uh, deoxid the socket here. And I'm gonna put one of the working CIAs in here from the other machine. I actually just don't know if the system works without the CIA installed altogether. Oh, what a crunchy socket. Not good. No life, no life at all. We're getting absolutely nothing on the CPU. And we're getting a red screen. Well, you know what's interesting though, is with the CIA that I took out of here that was causing the computer to stay in halt, you know, we get that purple screen. Here we're actually getting, you know, something. Well, let's take out this other one here. The one <laughs> I haven't taken out yet. Oh boy, very, very crusty as well. And I'm gonna insert the working one from the other machine. And let's just see if that changes anything. Because of course, uh, to hope the serial port's doing anything at all, we need to have working. <laughs> These need, chips need to be working. All right, well, no, that doesn't seem to result in anything. And we're still getting that red solid screen. At least it's consistent though. It's consistently giving us a red screen. And the purple is not showing up anymore, which I'm assuming is just because it's initializing the Denise chip right away. And I'm wondering if the diagnostic ROM is trying to tell us maybe the RAM is not working at all. And that's what you get when you have non-working RAM is you get that red screen. My assumption is when I put back in this original Kickstart ROM, we're gonna go back to just having green screen. It will be green every time immediately. Purple and then, wow, that sort of seemed like a normal boot process. What? What? Is this actually working? <laughs> I mean, what? Oh my God, I can't even believe it. Look at this. <laughs> this, is the, this is the field found machine. The field found machine. And it freaking <laughs> showing the kickstart. What? Here's a recap. This machine has the original Paula. It has the original CPU, has the original Kickstart ROM, and it has the original Fat Agnes chip. The original Gary is in here as well, as, as well as the original Paula. I'm sorry, I said Denise. The Denise is the original graphics chip, and the Paula's original. We haven't even tested that, the sound. All I did is I changed out, well, I changed out the two CIA chips here from the other machine, and the freaking computer booted. I mean, <laughs> I'm... <laughs> Uh, let's power cycle the computer again, and let's just see if that was a fluke. No, no, this is not a fluke. Oh man, we're getting a little like, see that like a little bit of a uh, little graphical like dimming there. I wouldn't be surprised if these caps here are probably the, the cause of that. Oh yeah, I just touched them and it kind of went in and out. So I'll, I'll swap these two caps out. I think that's causing that problem. The computer is freaking working. I mean, <laughs> let's go back. Okay, wait, uh, let me think what I need to do here. So the two original CIAs, I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do the Dremel on its pins to clean those up and then I'll put those back in here and we'll see if this thing is working with all original chips, all original. <laughs> let's see what happens. All right, the two original CIAs are back in here. I did Dremel the pins, clean them up, put them in, I also swapped out the two capacitors here. Take a look at the reason why those weren't working so well. Yeah, uh, we lost the positive leg on both sides. So that's a thing. In fact, one of them got lodged in my desoldering gun, which was a bit of a hassle. Now these are 3300 microfarad. I didn't have any of that size. So I put in 1000 microfarad 16 volt caps here. It should be good enough considering I don't know, we essentially had nothing on there. <laughs> I mean, I, I, there's no way these were doing anything with two broken legs. All right, so it's time to test this thing out again and we have all original chips. I think we're working. <laughs> I think we're working. <laughs> so none of the chips were bad. It was just all the sockets. And of course, Deoxit plus the Dremeling. I'm assuming we're gonna get the Kickstarter logo here in a second. All that troubleshooting I was doing with the oscilloscope, well, none of it was really necessary. And there it is. And yeah, if I poke around this area now, we no longer have any kind of <laughs> the video going in and out. 
So there we go. If I had just started by removing all the chips and putting deoxid in there, we would have been good. I didn't actually do the Paula chip yet, that sound chip. So it's probably the one we should do next. But <laughs> field found Amiga 500, it just freaking works. It just freaking works. Unfreaking believable. Alrighty, I think I'm gonna stop this video here. This is a good stopping point. Now, this is kind of funny. Truth be told, I finished working on this video two days ago, about 48 hours ago. And in going to record this intro, I went to turn the machine on just to see if it was still working. I just wanted to make sure that we were still getting to the kickstart screen. And well, it turns out I had left it on. It's been on for two days, about 48 hours. And as you can see, it's still sitting there at the kickstart screen. So I guess it's still working. Just for fun, let's power cycle it and just make sure that it's still working and it is. And you know what? We didn't even see the purple screen coming from the Denise chip. That's kind of intriguing. I wonder if that problem self fixed itself. We've obviously not reached the end of the work that I need to do on this machine. So we're gonna call this video part one. In part two, we're gonna dig further into this motherboard and make sure that it's actually fully functional. So run some diagnostics, make sure workbench runs, all that kind of stuff. I also have the RAM expansion card here that we took out of that rusty shell. I want to see if this thing works. And then we still have the computer case with the keyboard in it and the disk drive, and then that really bad power supply. So we're going to take a look at those probably in part two, but if part two runs really long trying to troubleshoot this motherboard, then that might be in a future part. As for the Commodore 1084 monitor, I think I'll do a repair video or at least a testing video on the second channel. I don't know how repairable that monitor is considering all the controls are completely frozen, like every knob and switch. So it may just be a testing video, but uh, yeah, watch for that on the second channel. As for this computer, I'm pretty ecstatic that it's actually working. And look, I gave it a two day burn in and it's still working properly. We'll know more when we do further testing, but that is pretty amazing. Now I do want to address one thing really quickly. I have a feeling there will be comments from people who said that I should have just deoxided or taken all those chips out of the sockets and clean them, put them right back in. And this would have been like a five minute video. That's true, but that's not my style. I like to try to figure out what's actually wrong with the computer. So seeing that the 68,000 was stuck in halt, which means it's no way it's gonna execute code and trying to track that down and figure out what the problem was is actually part of the fun. And yeah, in the end, well, everything's working here by just cleaning the sockets and cleaning the legs off the chips and whatever. But nonetheless, that troubleshooting part of the process is I think really informative and a really good learning experience because you might have an Amiga 500 you're trying to repair that doesn't have corroded chips and corroded sockets like this one, but has a similar issue. So you need to be able to use some logical reasoning to try to figure out like what's keeping the computer from working to then hopefully figure out which chip is bad so that you can get the system working. And of course, this type of methodology works on other repairs as well, especially machines where everything is soldered onto the motherboard and you can't just simply swap a bunch of chips and clean the legs very easily. We just happen to be lucky because the Amiga 500 and the 2000, for instance, and I think the 1000 has most of the chips in sockets. So it allows for that type of testing more easily. Anyhow, if you enjoyed this video, a thumbs up would be really appreciated and hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. If you didn't like this video, you know what to do. Thanks to my patrons. Their names are scrolling beside the screen. They make this literally possible. I do this full time now. If it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be able to do it. So a huge, huge thanks to them. If you want to become a supporter, you can do so at the link in the description below. There is early access to videos, plus behind the scenes and the occasional live stream on there. And uh, yeah, that's going to be that. So that's it. So stay healthy, stay safe. I'll see you next time. Bye.